Spinosaurus is one of the most famous and controversial dinosaurs, with countless different theories over the years on what it looked like, what it ate, what the spine is for, was it aquatic, was it just a good swimmer, and so forth. But I'm sure a lot of these controversies could have been easily sorted out much sooner if we still had the original specimen and holotype fossil, but sadly it was destroyed many decades ago. This is the story of the discovery and subsequent destruction of that specimen. Our story starts in 1912 in the Gilded Age of Dinosaur Discovery. Many species have been discovered in the Americas and Europe, and now North Africa proved to be another gold mine of discovery. The desert landscape exposed rocks of different strata and fossils to the surface, and for many centuries bones had been found but nothing thought of them. Our specimen specifically was found in the Baharia Oasis in the western desert of Egypt. At this point in time, though officially part of the Ottoman Empire, Egypt was ruled over by an occupying British force and had been since 1882 and the Anglo-Egyptian War. The Baharia Oasis is a large depression in the Sahara desert, allowing for human habitation. This area is rich in large theropod discoveries. The first skeleton specimens of Carcharodontosaurus and Bahariasaurus were also both found in this formation. Though the German paleontologist Ernst Stromer gave the name Spinosaurus, it is actually Richard Markgraf who is credited with the discovery of the first Spinosaurus specimen. Richard Markgraf was a Czech paleontologist who specialised in Egyptian expeditions. He met the other important paleontologists of this story. Ernst Stromer in 1901 and became his fossil collector. Stromer was German, but Markgraf was Czech, meaning he was a citizen of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, and this created a lot of issues for them, as after the discovery of Spinosaurus in 1912, by 1914 war had broken out between the Entente and Central Powers pitting Britain against Germany and Austro-Hungary, and so they could no longer return to Egypt to find more specimens. This caused Markgraf to lose his main source of income, falling into poverty and dying of an unknown illness in 19. 16, largely forgotten. But before his sad end, the two enjoyed over a decade of good friendship and embarked on expeditions together. The actual expedition that found the 1912 Spinosaurus was a long and complicated one. Stroma arrived in Alexandria in November of 1910 with the aim not of finding dinosaur fossils, but mammal fossils, as it was Stroma's aim to discover the origins of the human species. Markgraf lived south of Cairo, and so Stroma travelled there to meet him and prepare the three-stage expedition. Firstly, they went to the Wadi El Natrum northwest of Cairo to get at the exposed rocks in the valley. Various typical North African fossils were found such as crocodile jaws, turtle shells and shark teeth, but after a few weeks Stroma returned to Cairo rather empty handed in the way of mammal fossils. He left Markgraf in Wadi El Natrum while he made preparations for the second stage, in which time Markgraf found a fossil skull of an extinct primate, later named Libipithecus Markgrafi after its discoverer. Emboldened by this discovery, the second stage went ahead, and Stroma and Markgraf travelled down the Nile to Luxor to scour the eastern side of the Nile Valley in hopes of more mammal finds. Weeks more of digging and hiking and nothing was to be found, so they moved on to stage 3, which was to travel north again to the Baharia Oasis and the exposed strata in the region. However, Markgraf fell ill as he was prone to doing so, and was left behind by Stroma. Markgraf eventually caught up and met Stroma in Baharia, but only weeks after Stroma had arrived. But in that time, little in the way of mammal fossils had been found. Plenty of shark teeth and crocodile fragments, but no mammals. Some large leg bones were found on the 18th of January, which from context seemed to be those of either Baharia-saurus, Carcharodontosaurus, or Egyptosaurus, as leg bones were found for all three of these species, all of which Stroma would leave lying around in Munich undescribed until the 1930s, but still not a mammal. On the 18th of February 1911, Stroma left Baharia and made his journey back to Germany, but Markgraf stayed behind in the area and would routinely revisit the site even when the whole expedition was at an end. When Spinosaurus was discovered by Markgraf in the area in 1912, it made the whole unsuccessful expedition seem worth it. In 1915, Ernst Stromer fully described the fossils found in Egypt. Like most specimens, Spinosaurus aegypticus was very fragmented. All that had actually been found at the dig is what is shown here in pink. Parts of the lower jaw, including 20 teeth, one caudal, two cervical, three sacral and several dorsal vertebra, and very other small bits of material. But it was the dorsal vertebra and the jaw that were obviously the most striking of the discoveries. When the skeleton was brought back to Stromer, it was these two features that made the find worth it despite its fragmentation. Stroma's original drawings of what he termed Spinosaurus, due to the large dorsal vertebra, follow closely the designs of other
other theropods during the early 20th century, standing upright with its tail dragging along the ground. Despite recognising the crocodilian-like nature of the lower jaw, Stromer also decided to draw it into the already known framework of other theropods due to how little material had actually been found and how uncertain Stromer was about this strange new specimen. The fossils remained in Munich at the old academy building for decades as Stromer moved on to describing other finds like Carcharodontosaurus, which would then also eventually be put on display alongside Spinosaurus. In 1933, much to Stromer's distaste, the Nazi party rose to power in Germany, and by 1939, Europe was at war. At the start of the war, Munich was viewed as safe from potential air raids due to its huge distance from the UK, being nestled at the foot of the Alps. However, as the war progressed and the Luftwaffe shrank while the capabilities of British and American bombers increased, Munich became a clear target. Munich and the surrounding area held important industrial facilities, but crucially the city itself represented the heart of Nazi culture, having been the city in which the ideology was born. The propaganda potential of bombing the city made it a very inviting target in the eyes of Allied Bomber Command. Stromer repeatedly pleaded with the director of the Academy building to move the collection out of Munich, and most likely into the various mineshafts and bunkers that the Nazis were hiding their treasures in. However, the director refused as he was a devout Nazi and believed that removing the fossils would undermine the propaganda machine, and fully believed in the Luftwaffe's abilities despite its dwindling numbers by the later half of the war. There were 74 bombing raids on Munich and the immediate surrounding area during the war, but it was the raid on the 24th and 25th of April 1944 that is of interest to us. During the day of the 24th, the US Army Air Force attacked the area with over 700 bomber aircraft and over 800 fighter escorts, damaging a vast area. And as was the mode of operation during the war, the daytime American attack was then followed by a nighttime British attack of 234 Lancaster bombers. They destroyed 80% of all buildings in their target area alone. It was during this nighttime attack that the Munich Old Academy building was hit, and Stromer and Mark Graf's Spinosaurus was destroyed and lost to science. Along with it, Stromer's Carcharodontosaurus, Egyptosaurus, Bahariosaurus, and endless more fossil specimens at the museum were destroyed. Stromer didn't just lose his precious fossils during the war, he lost two of his three sons, with his third son Wolfgang being captured and imprisoned by the Soviets until 1950, all the while he was believed to have been killed in action. Stromer died in 1952 at the age of 81 in West Germany. Having been born in 1871, he had witnessed the birth of the German state, its defeat and humiliation in World War I, its almost complete destruction in World War II, and its partition in the Cold War. And all the while, his true passion for science and discovery endured despite the crippling toll war and death had upon him and his discoveries. 